Hi, I'm Amanda Morrell, Personal Finance Editor with Interest.co.nz, and welcome to another one of our Double Shot interviews. I'm joined today by the New Zealand Superfund CEO, Adrian Orr. Welcome, Adrian. Yeah, thanks. So recently, the fund hit us a record high. That was in September of $20.8 billion. Um, so the fund, for those who are unaware, was started back in 2013, and this is to help uh, pay for the costs of the uh, New Zealand superannuation. Now, there's a lot of uncertainty about the long-term outcome and whether it's going to be sustainable or not. So um, for me, anyhow, I'm particularly interested because when this fund starts paying out, it'll be about five years shy of my retirement. I want to know that there's some money in there. But based on your performance to date, things are going quite well with this fund. Can you tell us how this fund has been performing per annum, I guess, since inception? Yeah. Um, well, thank you. And, and we are pleased with how it's been performing. I was busy trying to calculate your age from, uh, <laughs> from 2029 backwards. Um, 2029 is when we first start paying out. Um, we've been investing now since largely the end of 2003, and so you know, around nine years investment performance. And we've averaged um, through that period, which has not been a normal period, I'd have to say, mind you, what is normal, um, around 7.5% per annum return for that. Which uh, is quite good relative uh, We're to very pleased. I mean, we set out uh, an expectation at the beginning based on the construction of our, our fund, um, working back from our purpose, you know, very long-term investment horizon. We thought, well, we should be exposed to growth assets, and so we have a high proportion of our assets exposed to um, global equities and, and growth investments. And we thought with that portfolio, we would get basically the risk-free rate of return, mm -hmm. the New Zealand Treasury bill, plus about 2.5% per annum um, over and above that um, as a return expectation. Now, that, that's a midpoint expectation. Um, over a long horizon. Uh, as it turns out, uh, probably by more chance than planning, um, we are basically right there. With 7.5% is effectively the T-bill, plus 2.5%. So over you're and pleased above. with, you feel you've hit yeah. your mark? Yeah, we're, you know, we're, we are on, on within expectations and um, we feel that we are well positioned you know, to, to continue with, um, with um, some pretty solid returns not without um, plenty of um, highs and lows on the journey. Mm. Okay, so you've shuffled the deck recently, and you're obviously, yeah. you've said, keen on international yeah. equities as well. China as well, you've picked up a rather significant investment there in their infrastructure fund. Yes. So tell us a little bit about that. How much did you buy, and what makes you so sure that the infrastructure is going to keep on growing in China? Yeah, well, uh, I wish I was so sure about any of our investments. I mean, we... Our, our challenge is to deliberately look for risk and risk that we believe that we're going to be rewarded for taking. And uh, you know, that is the only way you'll get returns. So it's about being, um, being disciplined in saying what type of risks are we prepared to take on and are we going to be adequately rewarded for that. Um, the China investment you mentioned is um, it's you know it's it's about a hundred million dollar investment, um, which is you know it's a significant check, but it's actually a small proportion of the total fund, and it, really it's one of the many um, direct investment activities that we're undertaking to ensure that our fund is fully diversified, first and foremost, but also getting exposed to areas that we think will be continued good profit, high growth over that 20 plus year horizon that we're interested in. Um, China itself, you know, is, it's no secret that it's been one of the fastest growing economies, um, or, or the fastest growing economy for the last 10 plus years. Um, fast economic growth doesn't always translate, or it often doesn't translate into good returns for the owner of the capital. So, you know, for us to enter China, rather than just taking a blanket by the market, we've been teaming up with, um, I suppose, um, the giants of the industry within China. And with that investment, the infrastructure investment, we've been pleased to be able to co-invest with um, Tomasek, the Singapore peer fund of ours, uh, a lot larger than us, um, the Korean Investment Corporation, um, a very similar fund to ours out of Korea, and also uh, the Bank of China International. Um, so the three, uh, four of us have gone in together and um, taken a private equity stake in uh, an infrastructure uh, in a company that is involved in looking for quite unique opportunities in, in providing uh, infrastructure services to some of the large companies that 
uh, continue and will continue to operate in China. Okay, we had uh, Brian Gaynor in earlier this week, and we were discussing some of the research involved in in, in their stock selection, the companies they invest in. Can you just, uh, the, I'm sort of interrupting the flow a bit, but tell us huh. about your strategy and how, how you know, what do you, are you making yeah. um, site visits as well and, and meeting with these yeah. parties? What, yeah. what What's the process? Yeah. Um, for us, I mean, you know, we're a, a, a very large fund, so we have to use many processes. But we like to keep it very simple um, in, in the way that we talk about it. And um, being a, a web-based company yourselves, um, you know, I, I do encourage your viewers and, and readers to have a look at our website and there it's a very simple description of the way we approach and how we go about investing. Um, probably the, the two main steps are we have what we call our passive reference portfolio. So thinking about our purpose, maximising return over the horizon, you know the 20 plus year horizon, we set up what we call our reference portfolio and that is a passive listed portfolio. And it's saying how can we get the growth exposure we need in the most cost effective manner, um, least cost manner. And that's just buying into listed markets right. and the indices. So that is our reference portfolio. And then we think about what else could we do to add value over and above just that passive listed reference portfolio. Yep. And there we set up a series of, of strategies which are strongly anchored to our investment beliefs, how we think markets operate, mm -hmm. and our endowments, you know, who we are, our horizon, liquidity. And so our active investment strategies, they, they span from um, infrastructure, as we've talked about, mm -hmm. timber, uh, private equity, multi-strategy funds. Uh, we are also a seller of insurance in terms of... Um, life settlements and catastrophe bonds, and we are very opportunistic. If, if large single investments turn up where we see a really good reward for the risk, mm -hmm. then we will be involved directly. Okay, so let's talk about, this is probably a, a good time to actually yeah. talk about some investments closer to home. Yeah. Let's talk about Scales Corporation in Christchurch. What kind of value yeah. do you see there? Well, you know, Scales Corporation was, it was a classic example of us, um, one of our endowments is, is that we're New Zealand based and there's not a lot of other people with a checkbook our size. Um, Scales Investment came through one of our, initially through one of our external managers, Direct Capital, who run one of our private equity portfolios. Um, we were already going to be invested um, into Scales because Direct made a decision to go there. Um, they, they make their own investment decisions um, using our capital and others. But we said, hey, we would like even a bigger slice of that action. And um, so we, we co-invested beside that fund. And so we ended up with one third of Scales Corporation. It's a, uh, you know, it was being sold in a relatively distressed situation. It's got um, a fantastic set of products. It's uh, a, a market we're really interested in, being exposed to um, to global food um, demand going on, mm -hmm. particularly with the rising middle income um, in, in a lot of the emerging markets. And so it ticked a lot of boxes. You know, we were in the right space. It was thematically based for us. It was being well researched and managed through direct capital, and we were able to have more oversight over the investment decision. Okay. Well, primary commodities is going to be a real hot one going forward. You're yeah. also quite keen on dairying as well. Tell yeah, us what your yeah. exposure has been there. Well, we have, we have a, a global strategy around rural in total, so it's not just dairy. What what we're interested in is being involved in where you've got a rising middle income globally and all of the demands that come with that, and protein and food security is, is one of those demands. Mm -hmm. We're interested in getting exposure um, to the farm gate level directly, because mm -hmm. we can get exposure to all of the manufacturing through listed markets. And to do that, you have to get on the ground and effectively buy farms. Um, although it's a global portfolio at the moment, we are world famous throughout New Zealand. Um, in the sense that the money we've committed to date has all been in New Zealand, around 110 million plus, and it has been all in dairy farms. But we remain open-minded about alternative agriculture, as well as agriculture globally, and we've been working with a lot of peer funds about how we can get invested there. The dairy farms, uh, it's, it's been, you know, it's tough to get access to them. You know, you've really got to bang on the doors and work hard, and um, they never sold cheaply. 
um, you know, farmers like to buy the neighbours and there's a lot of global demand for farms. So we've been taking our time, slowly building up a portfolio in that space and we remain hopeful and, and uh, very eager to continue that investment portfolio. Okay, how about utilities? That's going to be a hot topic also for 2013 with yeah. all the SOEs floats coming yeah, up. Yeah, what yeah. kind of position will you be taking on Mighty River Power and some of the others coming up? Yeah, well, the, the good thing that um, we've been able to do at the fund is, is communicate really clearly how we think about investment strategies. And so that's allowed us to talk quite openly about, about our positions um, related to the SOE potential sales. The first thing is that to the extent that they are listed, we will end up owning um, a fairly large proportion anyway through... Um, through we have 5% of our fund allocated to New Zealand listed equities. Yep. So we'll, we will pick up a, a, a direct holding through through that listed exposure. For us to go overweight, in other words, to buy even more than that 5%, really is going to be a function of the price. Um, you know, we, we're going to be taking on a certain risk. We want to know how we're going to be rewarded for that risk. Mm -hmm. And at that point, compared to all of the other opportunities we have on the table, yeah. So, you know, we, we, like the rest of the public in New Zealand, are in a wait-and-see position mm -hmm. as, yeah. as these details get nailed and, and we get to see what is, what is the price there. At some point, you know, um, we have 24% of our fund already invested in New Zealand, and so we always also have to be very aware of um, concentration concerns mm -hmm. and, and be rewarded if we are... Um, you know, removing diversification. So, you know, we'll be running our, our numbers pretty carefully. Okay, excellent. Now, um, at the same time, you've also paired um, some of your investments. You've got rid of, um, just last month, I believe, or this month, Freeman McMoran over yep, some yep. alleged human rights abuses and a few others. So this relates to your own standards that you have on socially responsible investments, which That's I'm right. quite interested in. So for the benefit of, of people who weren't aware, like myself, yeah. that you actually had a standard, what is, do, you have, do you work on a negative or a positive screen basis? What, what's your selection process when it comes to corporate good citizenship? Yeah, again, um, you know, uh, I, I do invite your, your viewers and readers to have a look at our website. There's some, there's some. Um, we, we've tried to uh, be really clear in what we're about. So, uh, one part of our stemming right back to our purpose. It's it's quite simple. Um, our mandate, I should say, our purpose is to pay to assist paying for future retirement income. But our mandate is maximise return without undue risk, and invest without prejudice to New Zealand's reputation internationally. Mm. And that second part leads us into our responsible investment process. And there we are very focused on um, environmental, social governance issues. And we are very focused on those to the point where we say uh, a clear checklist before we invest and a clear checklist when we're invested as to whether we should be engaging with companies who might be in breach of, of um, the standards that we've set. The standards are uh, quite clear, they're New Zealand law, I mean obviously they're breaking New Zealand law, that's New Zealand's preferences, um, see you later. Um, international law and any international, I suppose, global agreements, um, binding agreements mm. that we as a nation have mm. signed up to. Uh, we also work with the United Nations principles of responsible investment. So we, we lean on, on uh, global standards and our own New Zealand legal standards. The Freeport McMoran um, issue was uh, they were a, a mining company operating in, uh, in uh, West Papua. Um, they ended up breaching and a, a situation around human rights. Uh, they were having to use um, uh, security forces um, for their sec um, security at the mine and they had no real control over the, over the degree of force or, or abuses that were happening through that security force. And so our preference always is to engage positively with a company saying, hey, this is an issue, can you make a change? Right. And we like to engage with other um, global investors so that we matter, right. you know, that there's a lot of money on the table and we're saying we could do something. If we believe that engagement is just not going to be effective, mm -hmm. eventually we say goodbye. And, and so was it a three strikes out situation with Freeman? Uh, well, the first, you know, in, in one way, yes. Uh, the three strikes really is get the facts on the table. And that's too often people react, a knee-jerk reaction. And that, those reactions reflect badly on New Zealand's reputation. So 
as frustrating it is for, frustrating as it is for some people, we say, look, we want to understand the facts. Mm. The second bit is give the companies a chance to engage mm. you know, and, and make a change. It's like consumers. You know, we say, hey, I'd really prefer to know where my food mm. comes from. And over time, consumers have led to a change. Mm. And so investors are trying to play the same game, saying, show us how you're going to change mm. and we may stay with you. Right. But if you get to a position where no change or they're unable to change, then we will exit. And so we've done that with several outfits, um, tobacco, um, a cigarette company's not going to stop making cigarettes. Um, um, so, you know, we... we They're uh, automatically... Uh, we that's right. The we, the engagement's a waste of time. So, okay. so we left. Uh, whaling, illegal in New Zealand. Um, uh, cluster munitions signed to the Global Compact. Um, uh, the landmines, illegal. Um, uh, nuclear warhead construction illegal. And so, you know, those areas where we've just, we have uh, divested. But we have a continuous engagement program across, mm. across a whole host of other issues. And this is relatively new for the fund, though. It's only been in the past three years, has it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think so. Formally? I've been at the fund just gone five years, and yeah, it's about, it's about a four and a half year mm. program. We were busy engaging, putting it into place um, when I first arrived. And it's a non-trivial thing. You know, we are only one of very few funds globally who who follow this, but it is the growing trend, and particularly using the United Nations um, resources, the principles for responsible yep. investment. Yeah, well, yeah. that's very encouraging. Yeah. Now, I'm going to put you on the hot spot here. It's something Excellent. that comes up quite often, the sustainability of this fund, yep. the whole age of eligibility. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's your position on that? I mean, everywhere else around the world, they're bumping up to 67 just to make that, you know, yeah. to stretch it out a yeah. bit more. Is this something um, we ought to be doing, in your opinion? Uh, well, again, it's simple in my world. Um, I don't have to have an opinion on that because our fund is only a small part. I mean, the the age of retirement and the generosity of, of retirement income is a government decision. This fund is purely standalone. We will help fund um, whatever the eventual cost is. So, so our fund and sustainability is unrelated to age or generosity mm. of that. Um, in New Zealand, you know, there are, in any country, there's three tiers to retirement income. There's this, the guaranteed component from central government, and that's what we're talking about. And, and we're here to help um, partially pre-fund that future cost. There's a second tier, which is what you might be doing with your employer. In New Zealand, that's the Kiwi Saver, and that's just starting to grow and, and, um, and do well, which is a great thing. And then the third tier is what else should we be doing as individuals over and above that, saving and investing. Mm. And that's, that's a very weak area. So, so yes, there's a lot of interest around the central government um, universal retirement income and eligibility, and I'm sure there'll be debate there forever. But there's a still a lot of work to be done on, on tier two and tier three. You know, mm. Are we getting the best bang for buck Kiwi Saver? And yeah. what else are we doing as individuals to be saving? Right. And the answer is uh, in that third tier, Start we're not doing much <laughs> and we should do a lot more. Okay, excellent. Yeah. I think that's a good note to leave it on. Adrian Orr, thank you very much for joining yeah. us. Adrian's the Chief Executive Officer of the New Zealand Superfund. I'm Amanda Morrell, Personal Finance Editor with interest.co.nz, and this has been another one of our double-shot interviews.